Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be talking about the Carol Khan. After e4, c6, d4, d5, knight c3, d takes e4, knight takes e4. And we're going to be exclusively talking about the Karpov variation. And today I'm going to be exclusively talking about this very tricky move and what is actually considered the main line, the move knight to g5. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please go ahead and click that subscribe button and please click on that notification icon. So the main idea behind knight g5 is it's not so easy for black to kick that knight away with a move like pawn to h6 as much as he would like to. If black were to play pawn to h6 right here, we can meet that with the move knight e6, and the knight is essentially invincible. We can't take this knight because if we do, pause the video, see if you can find it, we're getting mated. Queen h5 check, and then if g6, queen g6 is mate. So we wouldn't be able to take this knight. Now it is possible to play something like, say, queen a5 check, and then after bishop d2 to play queen b6 and put pressure on this b2 pawn. But in these cases, white can actually just leave that knight on e6, and black still can't take it. If, for example, bishop d3, it looks like black can take the knight, but of course he can't. If he takes the knight, we still fly in with queen h5 check, and it is specific. We do need to do it with the queen. And then after king d8, pause the video, see if you can find it. We have bishop a5 winning the queen. So an alternative that maybe makes some sense is to put the queen on b6 straight away without prefacing it with queen a5. Of course, if we do this, we're not actually putting any pressure on b2 since we never forced the bishop on c1 to move. So it is possible for white to just play some lazy chess and just declare an advantage um, because after knight f8, knight f8, white has the bishop pair and can declare some sort of slight edge here. For example, c3, bishop f5, knight e2 should simply be slight edge white. Another way that we can play this is we can still offer up the sacrifice, and these positions should be relatively unclear. If, for example, bishop d3, fe6, we could play bishop g6, king d8, knight f3 is a relatively unclear position, since I have no idea how black is going to unwind, finish his development, or get his king to eventual safety. So these positions are relatively unclear. White can continue with kind of normal moves. Castle's kingside, pawn to c4, rook to e1, and just continual improvement. So this is actually very similar to the idea in the main line where blackboard to play knight on g to f6. What black is trying to do is black is trying to build up to the point where he can play pawn to h6, and white is trying to constantly tell black that he can't. So what white needs to do is white needs to play bishop d3, again telling black that you're not going to quite be able to play h6 quite yet, because again, knight e6, f e6, now I'm going to play bishop g6 mate, this still isn't good for you. So black is going to continue with the move pawn to e6, saying, hey, I want to play h6, and then we're going to continue on knight on uh, g to f3, and now it seems like black can finally play h6, but again, this is a problem. If h6, white can still play knight takes e6, and this is exactly what happened in the deeper blue versus Gary Kasparov game back in 1997, and Kasparov's best bet back then would have been to play fe6 straight away. This would have been a lot better than what he played. These positions are closer to unclear, but white is probably still just a little bit better after bishop g6, king e7, castles kingside. Say something like queen c7, rook e1, king d8. Uh, pawn to c4 is just an unclear position. It's uh, still not clear exactly how black unwinds his position, but he's not in any immediate danger. And white has sacrificed an entire piece. But in exchange for that, he has more space, he has a better attacking position, and it's not clear how black ever finishes his development. Uh, but Kasparov did not do even that. Kasparov played queen e7, which turned out to be quite a bit worse. After castles kingside fe6, bishop g6, king d8, Bishop f4, it was basically impossible for black to unwind his position. And Kasparov did the worst thing he could have done. He opened the position even further. He played b5, which made things incredibly loose. And the computer played with extreme accuracy, just planting his pieces in the middle of the board, opening up the position, and eventually uh, making big enough threats that Kasparov decided to sacrifice his queen but still ended up with a completely losing position at the end of all of that. And that was uh, Deeper Blue versus Gary Kasparov played in New York back in uh, 1997. And that was a, just a terrible end to that particular match. Um, and it was something that never should have happened. Uh, Kasparov was just a much better player than that. And 
honestly, the Carol Con wasn't even in his repertoire. So it was like the first game he ever played the Carol Con with Black. He ended up losing. So it was kind of dumb. Okay, so that's what we're going after. So the main move here should be something like Bishop d6. And then the whole point is after uh, Queen e2. Now we can finally play pawn to h6. And knight e6 in this case does not work. So this knight does have to finally retreat back to e4. Then we have knight e4, queen e4. And then the main move here is going to be queen c7, although knight f6 is also possible. Uh, knight f6, I think, is more common on the lower levels, but it's not a terribly difficult to move to meet. We're just going to retreat that queen to e2, and then basically just eventually plant a knight on e5. And we can simply declare these positions um, slight advantage. Uh, white. As a matter of fact, Vasily Ivanchuk managed to beat Karpov himself in a game uh, in this particular line played in Monte Carlo back in 1996. So even Karpov has a difficult time playing these positions with the black pieces once a white knight firmly plants itself on e5, and it's difficult to get rid of it. So the other way that this gets played is uh, the immediate queen c7, and then white should respond with the immediate queen to g4. And then king f8, and then here the main move is simply castle's kingside. It is also possible to immediately bring the queen back to e4. This was my preference for a very long time. Um, however, after the move c5 and white continues with something like pawn to c3, it's not incredibly clear what to do after c takes d4, as it seems like the best reply is just to play cd4, and then on bishop b4, Maybe one of the best ways to play for an advantage here is just to give up castling rights with king f1. It's also possible to just play something like bishop d2 and just kind of declare that you have a very slight edge because black's king is still kind of stuck in the middle of the board. So for example, king e7 castles, knight f6, queen f3, rook d8, rook a c1, queen b6 leads to kind of an unclear position. But maybe white's a little bit better just because black hasn't finished his queenside development and the black king is still kind of stuck in the middle. But uh, there was just one game in this line after c3, c takes d4. There was Fedorowicz versus uh, Goko played in New York in 1998, and that ended in a draw. But uh, by far and away, I think the main line is for people just to castle. And then after, say, c5, you're going to have something like b3. And then after, say, uh, e5, you're going to have uh, takes, takes, and then something like bishop f5. And uh, these positions are considered uh, slight edge white. Um, white should be doing uh, quite all right in these positions. So the only other line that you kind of have to worry about in the Karpov position, and it does get played because there are quite a few players um, that do think that it's very possible to play this way, is if they play this other knight to f6. There are people that try this. They play um, instead of knight gf6, there are people that will play knight df6. And it's a weird and it's a goofy move. And um, it's not terribly difficult to figure out what to do um, against this. You just move out the other knight. And a lot of people do this because they're thinking, if I play this knight to f6, I have this bishop that's prepared to come out and develop like to the g4 square. And they think for some reason that you're not going to be able to develop this knight because here they think they can play h6, which is actually, of course, losing. Like here you have the same basic idea as in the other variations. You have knight f7, king f7, and then you have knight coming into e5, and then you're going to be proceeding with bishop d3 followed by bishop g6. So say, for example, king e8, you're going to have bishop d3, and there really is no preventing um, this idea of bishop to g6, and this is just very well known to just be advantage white. So this idea of knight to f6 not only is not something that shouldn't be, uh, that shouldn't be feared, it's something that really uh, shouldn't be played. Um, if, if knight to f6, knight on 1 to f3 is just a very solid move, we're threatening knight e5, and there's not a great way to counter it. Um, so anyways, uh, that is uh, basically your basic idea of how to play the Karpov variation with the white pieces and how to make this knight g5 idea work to give you a slight advantage under most conditions. So I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can use some of these ideas in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.